I just thought I would tell you a little bit about the overarching theme of the program and a little bit about the Berlioz piece we're going to hear. If you don't know it, it is one of the great pieces of music, and it's about a half an hour long, and I thought it might be useful if you knew a little bit about Berlioz himself, because I think his personal life and his attitudes kind of have some resonance in the piece itself. The theme of the afternoon is love, and we are going to be hearing love songs and arias about love in three different, three different languages. But, you know, you shouldn't think that it's going to be all birds and bees and hearts and flowers, because, of course, love is one of those emotions that is double-edged. It is both a many splendored thing, and it is also uh, the source of great pain when things don't go well. And Berlioz probably knew more about both sides of that equation than any of the great composers. He was one of these really eccentric 19th century romantics, and his relationship to love was almost an addiction. He seems to have been one of these people who, who needed the ecstasy of love in order to get his creative fires burning. And he's one of those guys who just lived way out there on the razor-thin border between ecstatic passion and utter madness. And it was his feelings about women that sort of dragged him back and forth across that line over the course of his life. And that's where this book comes in. He wrote very well. He was actually a critic. And he wrote about his whole life. And he detailed a lot of these relationships that he had with women, dating right from the very beginning when he was, believe it or not, 12 years old. And he fell desperately in love with a, a, an older woman. She was 18. Her name was Estelle. And he described his response thusly. He said, the moment I set eyes on her, I felt an electric shock. In fact, I fell in love with her desperately and hopelessly. I had no wishes, no hopes. I had no idea what was the matter with me, but I suffered acutely and spent nights in sleepless anguish. In the daytime, I crept away like a wounded bird and hid myself in the maize fields and the orchards. I was haunted by love's ghostly companion, jealousy, and suffered tortures when any man approached my idol. So off to a good start. <laughs> and about 10 years later, when he was a young man in his 20s, he went on successive nights to hear Shakespeare plays performed in English, although he did not speak English. He heard Hamlet, and then he heard Romeo and Juliet. And it didn't matter to him that he didn't understand the specific words because he fell in love both with Shakespeare and also with the beautiful Irish actress whose name was Harriet Smithson. And she was playing uh, Ophelia in the first and Juliet in the second. And he became so enthralled with her that he kept writing her letters, presumably in French, which she did not speak, night after night. And he records her response. I continued to write to her without ever receiving a single line in reply. My letters frightened instead of pleasing her, and she gave her maid stringent orders not to take any more of them. No words can describe what I suffered. Even Shakespeare has never painted the horrible gnawing at the heart, the sense of utter desolation, the worthlessness of life, the torture of one's throbbing pulses, the wild confusion of one's mind, et cetera, et cetera. And so he decided to process this love, perhaps sublimating it by turning her into the muse, the ide fix for the symphony he was writing, Symphony Fantastique. And once he had composed that, he sort of had her temporarily out of his system, and he went on to another woman, and he proposed to her, and she accepted, and they became fiancés. And then he won the Prix de Rome, which required that he go off to Rome for a season. And while he was there, her mother persuaded her to dump this crazy composer and to marry the piano manufacturer down the street named Monsieur Pleyel. So she did that, and she wrote to him, and he did not take it well. At the post office, I was handed a letter, the tenor of which was inconceivably painful to me. I was beside myself with passion and shed tears from sheer rage, and I made up my mind on the spot what to do. My duty was clear. 
I must at once proceed to Paris and kill the two guilty women and the innocent man. <laughs> After that, it would, of course, be incumbent on me to commit suicide. <laughs> Fortunately, he didn't do that. But he went back to Paris, tidied up Symphony Fantastique. He performed it in public. And Harriet Smithson, that beautiful Irish actress, came. And she was bowled over by it and by his passion. And in a moment of weakness or something approaching love, she said, let's get married. And they did. And unfortunately, not long after that, they made the distressing discovery that he still didn't speak English and she didn't speak any French. <laughs> which put a crimp in their relationship. <laughs> and she sort of went downhill from there. Having given up her great career, she became depressed, and then she became mired in alcoholism. And finally, they decided maybe it would be better to live apart from each other. And that gave him the opportunity to fall in love with another woman whose name was Marie Reccio. And she was a singer of sorts. And I say of sorts because everything I've read about her indicates that she was lovely to look at and just atrocious to listen to. <laughs> and she trailed him around on his concert tours, and she persuaded him, or maybe I should say she hectored him, into uh, arranging some of the songs we're about to hear, uh, one of them in particular called the Absence. And when she sang it, apparently, Nobody's heart grew fonder. Uh, <laughs> everybody just wanted to flee the room. And so after Harriet died, he married her with predictably bad results. Anyway, you get the idea. Now, if we go back a few years to the point at which his relationship with Harriet was beginning to disintegrate, and he had just developed eyes for Marie, at that point, he came across a set of poems by his friend Theo Gautier. And of course, they're all about love from various angles. And he set them to music, and he called them the Summer Nights. And they start out in ecstasy, and they kind of plummet precipitously down into the abyss. But they come out in the end in the same place. And it, it really starts in this mood of uh, young love. And the question it asks is, can this sort of thing ever be sustained? Can this ecstasy be eternal? And then. It goes down on this arc, and it comes back up. And at the end, we have those same lovers, perhaps, getting onto a boat and heading off towards some unknown island where perhaps love will survive. And uh, I think Berlioz's attitude by that time in his life was, well, good luck with that. So uh, anyway, I think you will enjoy the program a great deal. And uh, bon voyage, and enjoy yourselves. <laughs>